Well, we, we've been talking about <clears throat> awakening our worship this morning, and, and so logically, there's just something I had to show you. And, and so I, I brought it with me this morning. I just had to show you this and tell you all about it. It just, it moves me. If anybody knows me, you know that ice cream is just near to my heart. And there's, there's a flavor that I kind of got hooked on since I was a kid because my dad loves butter pecan ice cream. And I, I just had to show it to you this morning. I mean, I, I don't know if you can, can smell it from there, the, the buttery, the pecans, but I know this was a bit of an insensitive illustration, but I'm trusting God's going to work with it. Because when you just see that kind of scoop out of there, isn't that something? And then when it goes in the bowl, you know it's getting close to action. And one is never enough because the nuts are always just under the surface. Oh, I could, I could keep going here. But maybe, maybe that's enough for now. What do you think? So usually, you know, when you get to that point, your spoon comes out. And sometimes my spoon shakes out of anticipation. <laughs> you know, and I kind of move it around a little bit. And, and, and when it's really good, if you're really patient, which is really hard, you wait till it melts just a little bit, you know, and it starts getting a little bit liquidy in the bottom, and that's, that's the first scoop that I take. And I, I just knew how much you would appreciate me, me just sharing with you the attributes of ice cream. I could go on and on and on and out of respect for our fast, I won't eat any. <laughs> but I just thought I would leave that for you just to think about for a while because last week I asked you all, what captures the affections of your heart? And I challenged you, I gave you an assignment at the end of the message last week to think about what is your understanding of worship and what is it as you go through the week that you recognize captures the affections, the, the focus of your heart. Now I'll come back to this ice cream a little bit later on. But I want to bring us back to where we left off last week in our, our, our series called Awaken Our Worship. And we We said during this One Desire 21 Day Fast that this theme, Awaken Our Worship, really is a a prayer request. So last week's message was titled, Lord, Awaken My Worship. And and last week, the whole point of the message was to kind of introduce the topic, but to really get into your hearts, to stir something in your heart, to get you thinking about what you think when you think about worship. Please don't ask me to say that again. It was all to stir you up. So I hope this week you have been thinking a little bit more about worship than you have in weeks past. Anybody this week think more about worship than maybe you have in a while? Okay, I see some hands. That's good. That encourages a preacher. Well, this week we're going to continue where we left off last week and we're going to lay a foundation because over the next few weeks, as we go through the rest of this series, if, if we don't understand the biblical foundation of worship on the inside of us, then it really doesn't matter that we talk about the external part of worship, which is what we most often think about. So today we're going we're gonna to finish up and, and answer the question, what is worship? And then next week, we're going to begin some of the application and look about, if you understand what worship is, we're going to start applying it to our lives. And we're going to wrestle with, are we worshiping the living God or are we taming the living God in our worship? Next week, we'll look at, are we worshiping the living God or are we actually trying to tame the living God? And then we'll come back for the last part of the message and we're going to talk about the outer skin, the outer expression of our worship. Um, some have called it worship wars because there's very few things that are more divisive in the local church than outward expressions of worship. And so, as is our fashion in our church, we're going to go right through the front door and we're going to talk about it as we apply what we learned today. So there's the game plan. Are you ready? Roll up your sleeves, tighten up your shoes, because we're going to cover some ground today. Last week... We looked at 
two passages of scripture, John chapter four, as well as Psalm 57, and we made these general observations from scripture about worship. And and we learned that Jesus was changing the perspective about worship, and he taught that worship had moved from a place, that's the temple, to a person, Jesus. And we learned that worship moved from the outer rituals, all of the sacrifices, all of the activities in the temple, it had moved away from rituals in the outer sense to an inner reverence and relationship with the one we worship. And then in Psalm 57, we made four quick observations. We said worship comes from the heart. We said worship comes from the will. It's a decision you make. We said worship is our response to who God is and what he's done. And we learned that worship is our ultimate desire that will fulfill us. So, before we can fully answer the question, what is worship, we need to lay out a few more biblical principles and observations from Scripture. You're going to see the text on the screen. I'm not going to have time to to have you turn to every passage and read through them because we're going to be at about five or six or seven. But the references are up there, and I encourage you, Write them down, look at them, turn your Bibles to them by all means this morning, but then look at them in more depth this week in your own time alone with God. So the first one is from Matthew 15, verses 7 through 9, and it it, kind of builds on one of the observations we made last week. So the first principle that we want to look at today is this, true worship is first a matter of the heart, and Jesus made this very clear, black and white clear. In Matthew chapter 15, this is what he said. He said, you hypocrites. He's talking with the Pharisees. These religious people that had everything on the outside in perfect order. He says, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. And he quotes Isaiah. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts. And we saw that last week, that we would have a steadfast heart, O God. But this week, Jesus reminds us in an even clearer fashion. Their hearts are far from me. So if you you do a little bit of math and kind of the if-then statements, what you can figure out that Jesus is saying is, If hypocritical worship is heartless worship, then true worship is when our heart is brought to God, our heart is brought near to him, that we're not content with our lips, we're not content with our body movements, we're not content with our actions, but worship is first a matter of the heart. And and to the point, and this is why I felt we needed to come back and elaborate on this, to the point that Jesus is really saying If you go through all of these wonderful motions, and and, and in a few weeks, like I said, we're going to talk about our outward expressions, but some of us are more expressive when we worship than others. So I'm going to to pick on us for a little bit, because I would put myself in that camp a little bit. We can have all of the gestures and all of the, the squinting eyes and body movements, and Jesus is saying, if all you're doing is going through those motions but your heart is not being brought near me. It's in vain. It's empty. It's pointless. And for those that say, yeah, I hope those people are listening. (laughs) For those that are quiet or not as expressive and it's, 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 it's more internal, God can say, if you sit in that chair, you sit in that pew and you are faithful week after week after week, and you listen to the music, you sing the music, you pray, you don't pray, you listen to the prayers, but in your heart, you're thinking about what's going on after church today and when is this service going to get done and I can't believe we sang that song over three times in the last two months. God is saying it's empty, it's vain, it's pointless because your heart is not being brought near me. Worship, church, is first and foremost a matter of the heart, not this stuff we see on the outside. It has its place and we'll get to it. But first and foremost, worship is a matter of the heart. And so here's how, we, here's how we can really diagnose our hearts in worship. And you can do it right here this morning. You can ask yourself, first of all, do I only worship in public settings? 
do I only worship when I'm at church on Sunday morning between 10.45 and noonish? If that is the only time you worship, you do not understand worship yet. And I'm hoping you will, you will grow in that. Second question you can help to ask yourself, is my heart being brought to the Lord? Is this, am I bringing my heart near or just flapping my lips? That's my translation of this passage. When he said, you hypocrites, your, your lips are moving, but your heart's far away. Ask yourself, am I bringing my heart near or am I just going through the outward motions? Observation number two. We're going to move quick this morning. True worship is through faith in Jesus. True worship is through faith in Jesus. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 and 16, they say, it says this. It says, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Let me start with the beginning of this. So we're going to unpack two principles from this passage. It starts out, through Jesus, therefore, and then goes on to talk about what what worship and praise looks like that God accepts. But if you miss that opening statement, through Jesus, you do not understand worship. So this morning, what you need to understand first and foremost is that as we bring our heart to God, we are bringing our heart to him through the work that Jesus did on the cross when he died on the cross to pay the penalty, the consequence for our sins. The Bible says we are all sinners. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible says that the wages of death, what we, what we, the wages of sin, what we deserve, the consequences of sin, is death. Not just physical death, but a spiritual death, which is a spiritual separation from God forever. And the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now for some of you, this is faith 101. This is so familiar to you. So to you, that this is familiar, I just want to remind you that when you worship in whatever setting, are you coming to God through faith in Jesus? Are you coming to God in worship in whatever you're worshiping about and and saying, man, it's because of Jesus that I get to do this. That never gets old, God. That gift you gave me that my sins are forgiven not because of anything I did, It never gets old. For some of you, that that is maybe a newer truth to you. And there are times where you go, how could I ever worship God? Because I know what I did. I know who I am. I know how I live. I know how I've acted. I know how I've stumbled. I know the sin in my life. The scripture says, worship is through Jesus. When you come to the Father through Jesus, what you're coming through is saying, I believe that I am a sinner and deserve these consequences before a holy God and that I can do nothing about it on my own. And I believe that Jesus did it all for me. And at the moment you come to Jesus and place your faith in him, the Bible says you are forgiven. And when you come to worship him, God looks at you and now sees a forgiven person actually wearing the clothes of righteousness that belong to Jesus. The Bible says that his righteousness was transferred to us. We could never get it on our own. In the same way that our sins were transferred to him on that cross, it's this exchange. So worship is through faith in Jesus. His death, his burial, his resurrection all happened to restore this relationship, this heart relationship of worship. Matthew 27, verses 50 through 51, it says this. Sorry, I'm ahead of myself here. No, I'm not. It says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Do you guys remember or do you know what that that curtain is that they're referring to? 
in the temple where all worship was centered, there was this place called the Holy of Holies. It's where that, that, that presence of God dwelt. It was called the Holy of Holies, and there was only one person allowed in that part of the temple, and that was the high priest, and he could only come there once a year. There, there was this huge curtain from ceiling to floor that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple in the outer court. And when it says here in Matthew 27, it says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. The sacrifice had been done and was received and it was finished. It says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Notice the direction. It says, from top to bottom. God the Father was taking that curtain that separated us from his presence and said, it's finished. The way has been made for you because of what my son just did on the cross. True for worship is through faith in Jesus. It's that relationship we have with the living God. Third principle that we want to add to this concept about what is worship is this. Still in Hebrews chapter 13, true worship still offers sacrifices and offerings. You see, some of us, we hear that message that we no longer have to go to the temple and offer sacrifices, and we go, Yahoo! I don't have to do anything. But if we stop there, we haven't yet understood what true worship is. Listen again to what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise the fruit of lips that confess his name. And he's not done there. He says, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. The word sacrifice is used twice there. So I propose to you, church, that even though we worship through Jesus, even though the worship is not about the external things we do for God, This comes back to that principle last week of our response. There still are appropriate, acceptable sacrifices or offerings. And it gives us two categories here. It says the fruit of the lips that confess his name. So we we have the practical side of praise. See, sometimes we're tempted to say, I'm going to praise God, whether it be in our, our time alone with God or in a small group setting or walking throughout the day or in a corporate setting like this. And we're really into praising God. But then the, out of those moments, we forget them. But the practical side of praise that we're being taught here talks about what comes out of our mouth, the fruit of our lips, the praise and the proclamation of who God is. That's part of worship, proclaiming who he is. Matthew chapter 12 tells us and Luke tells us that it is out of the mouth, out of the overflow of the heart, sorry, the mouth speaks. What comes out of our mouth is a reflection of what's in our heart. And the writer of Hebrews is reminding us that our worship offers a sacrifice, something coming from our mouth, but it always reveals our character. It reveals what's inside. It reveals our faith and what we see and believe and understand about God. But it's not just about what comes out of our mouth. It's also what we do with our hands, the fruit of our hands. It's the love and action part. It says, and don't forget to do good. And that phrase, to do good, is a term from which we get the concept of benevolence. Doing good, giving to others because they have a need. Don't forget to do good and to share with others. And then it's very, very clear, he says, for with such sacrifices, both the fruit of our lips and how we we praise and proclaim him, as well as the love and action that we have, for such sacrifices, God is pleased. And we're encouraged to do this continually, which means on an ongoing lifestyle, an ongoing basis. Next observation is this. True worship draws attention to God. Now we're starting to get a little closer to home. When you and I worship, now there are our private times of worship when we're having our time alone with God and we've got our scripture open and we're praying and, and we're worshiping him. Of course, no one else is around. But there are other times in life we are worshiping him. 
We just got done talking about some of those. Remember this, true worship brings attention, draws attention, sends direction, focus, focuses attention on God. Listen to Psalm 34. It says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise was, praises will always be on my lips. My soul will, catch this word, my soul will boast in the Lord. How many of you guys ever think it's okay to boast in the Lord or, or to brag on God? Do you know that's an aspect of worship that's biblical? My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear. So somehow our worship is drawing attention to God so that others, the afflicted, hear and see and are drawn to him and rejoice. And then it says, and glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name forever. Just a very simple point here. As we're trying to wrap our heads around what is worship, worship should always not only draw us to God, but it should draw attention of others to God. When, we use, when you see terms in Scripture like extol, we don't use that word very often, exalt, somewhat often, not, not as much, glorify, all of these images together, just briefly this morning, is you see a platform up here, and you see we have spotlights that get turned on from time to time. We got lights up here. To extol the Lord, to exalt him, to glorify him is as if we're saying we're going to take some aspect of God and we're going to put it on a stage. And we're going to elevate that stage and we're going to shine a light on that stage so that everybody around sees what it is about God that we think is so amazing. Does that simple image make sense? That's worship. Worship draws attention to God. Like a spotlight on stage. Two last ones, and we're going to tie them all together and, and put it in down into one, one kind of practical definition of what is worship for us, and then we'll move forward with that in a week. So the last two observations, these principles that we're putting together, is this. From Philippians chapter 1 and Philippians chapter um, 3, we draw two principles. The first principle is this. True worship is to treasure Christ as gain is to treasure Christ as gain. And the second principle is this. True worship is to be satisfied with Christ. So let me read the passages, and then we'll unpack those two. Paul is writing the Philippians, and he doesn't know how long he's going to live. He's he's writing from a jail. He's going to be maybe put to death. He doesn't know. And so he's sharing his heart, and he says these things. He says, but what what does it matter? Because some, some friends were writing him and saying, hey, there are some other people, they're not really followers, but they're, they're, preaching. they're preaching Jesus. And Paul says, what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by my life or whether by my death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is to gain. And then a little further on in chapter 3, he continues on similar thoughts. He says, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. He he had just got done in this passage listing out all of his credentials, all of the things he's accomplished, all the things that other people would look at in life and go, wow, that's amazing. You are really something. He lists it all out. He says, eh. He continues on. He says, I consider them rubbish. And that's a polite way of putting that word. He's very, very graphic here. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God 
and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. True worship is to treasure Christ as our gain. The, the, the term there, gain, is, is a term used, uh, it's a mercantile term in, in trading. And the idea is that something of lesser value is exchanged for something of greater value. And, and Paul is saying, whenever I think of Christ, whenever my heart is lifted in, in praise and worship, I always think of all of this rubbish in my life when I compare it to Christ. It is of so far lesser value than Christ. I will treasure Christ. I will treasure everything I have in him and through him and because of him as great gain when I look at the stuff in my life compared to who he is. True worship is when we come to God, when we come to Jesus and and we worship him with this mindset that he is our treasure. He is this treasure that we have gained and we cherish him and we prize him and we value him above everything. When we understand this eternal hope we have, here Paul is wrestling with the fact that he may die and he's going, eh, if I live, that's good. Good for you guys. God gets to keep using me to serve you. But if I die, <laughs> hallelujah, that's good for me. He was okay either way. Why? Because when we understand our eternal hope, everything temporary, everything in this world, really is considered as a loss to us. We're not going to ever be able to hold on to it. So why strive to hold on to it for a day, a year, or even a lifetime when in the end it's gone? Whereas everything in Christ is true gain, true value, lasting value. To see Christ as a treasure, as valuable, means that we see him adding value to both our death, yes, eternity, but also, and this is what Paul's driving at, but also life. See, sometimes we worship God and go, oh God, I can't wait till you come and take me home. Just bring me home. Then it's all gonna be better. And we've missed out on so much of what God's word says. God says, I meet you today in your life, in this life. Jesus said, I I came to give you life, abundant life. So when we treasure Christ as our gain, don't just get hung up on when I die, I'm with him forever, but also treasure him as he is your peace today. He is your comfort today. He is your strength today. He's your encouragement today. He is your source of whatever you need to follow God's ways because he's given you his Holy Spirit. That's why we treasure him above everything in this life. There's nothing this world offers that can compare to Christ. And You guys hopefully know my heart by now when I say this. Nothing compares to Christ. Not even your family. Not even your bestest, bestest, bestest friends. Certainly not your finances or the career that you absolutely love or the hobbies that bring you such great pleasure in life, and the list could go on. None of that, when you compare it to Christ, holds water. And when we worship Christ, this stuff falls away, and we treasure him. And true worship is when we don't just treasure him, but we are satisfied with Christ. We're satisfied with him. The inner essence of worship is, yes, treasuring Jesus, But when we truly treasure him and what he offers us today, not just for eternity, we can find that we can be satisfied. Do you know that's where true joy comes from? Joy is not happiness. Happiness can flow out of joy, but it is not the same. I am not always happy. But by God's grace, we can be joyful at all times in all things. Why? It's because when Jesus is our treasure and when we recognize all he offers to us, all he is for us and all he's done for us, we can be satisfied and at peace and content 
that no matter what we face, no matter what's in front of us, with Jesus, we have enough. With Jesus, we have enough, and we can be satisfied with Christ. John Piper has a saying that's become fairly fairly well known to many who read or listen to any of his works, and he puts it this way. He says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. I love that. God is most glorified, he's most worshipped in us when we are the most satisfied in him. And that comes when we rehearse our faith and all these things we've been talking about. When we treasure Christ in light of his worth and his value, worship becomes a natural flow of a satisfied heart. Don't you find that? When we treasure Christ in light of who he is and his worth and his value, worship becomes a natural flow out of our heart. And when we worship in light of eternity, that ultimate hope that we have, worship becomes a natural flow of a satisfied heart. So, with all of these principles, true worship is first a matter of the heart. True worship is through faith in Jesus Christ. True worship still offers sacrifices and offerings. That's that outer part of worship. True worship always draws attention to God. True worship treasures Christ as gain, and true worship is to be satisfied with Christ. Putting all that together, I'm going to give you a definition that we walk out of here with. It's in two parts. The first one is just kind of a, 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 a quick one-liner. If we were to say at Word of Life Baptist Church, as we move forward, if we want to say, are we a church, of, a faith community that are, are worshiping in spirit and in truth, then understand first that true worship is both an inner experience and an outer expression. And that's what the next two weeks are going to unpack. True worship is both, but it starts with the inner experience, the, the inner faith. But to put the full definition to it that I'm going to be working with, here it is. True worship, therefore, is inwardly knowing, treasuring, and being satisfied in God above all things. If you want to be a a 100% worshiper, we talked about that two weeks ago, are are you a 100%er? If you want to say, am I a 100%er? Am I offering all of my life in worship? It is inwardly knowing him. That's your relationship. You have placed your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you've turned your back on placing your faith in yourself to earn that forgiveness. It's knowing, it's treasuring, that's what we just talked about, and being satisfied in God above all things. Not most things, not some things, but we strive to continue to to scurry things away. And that's why we spend these 21 days in prayer and fasting and devotion, saying, God, would you make my heart beat as one with yours? Because although I want to be a 100 percenter, probably every one of us would say, I'm not there yet, I'm still growing There are some things in my life that I treasure above Christ, that I find my satisfaction in other than Christ. And the Holy Spirit may be tagging some of those things in your heart right now. That's a good thing. God's saying, here's where you're going to grow this week if, if you walk with me, if you're willing. True worship is inwardly knowing, treasuring, and being satisfied in God above all things while outwardly, displaying, magnifying, and living for God's glory through all things. So we check our heart. Do we know him? Do we treasure him? Are we satisfied in him? And then we look at our life on the outside. Do we display him by how we live? Do we magnify him? That's that shining, that spotlight. Do people know? And do we live for God's glory? not our own? Do we draw attention to God? If somebody comes to, to, if somebody were to say of people at Word of Life Baptist Church, they are the most amazing people in Alpena, I would hang my head because that sentence isn't complete. It should be. It seems that because of what God has done in their life, they seem to be the most amazing people. 
See the difference? Worship draws attention to God. So, church, I, I, I come back to this absolutely ridiculous illustration I started with. Do you know what I did and why I did it here with this now soupy ice cream? It's because I was worshiping. I was displaying to you what I treasure. I, I, was, I was glorifying, shining this spotlight because I drew all of your attention to what satisfies my flesh. I was worshiping ice cream. You see? Now here's the singer. You knew it was coming. If we want to be a church that are awakened in our worship, we have to wrestle with this question. God, what is the ice cream in my life? Does that make sense? What is the ice cream in my life that I treasure, that I'm satisfied with, that I value, and that I tell everybody else about? May God's Spirit this week help you put a tag on that thing that may be just bubbled up in your heart. And as you continue in this last week of our 21-day fasting prayer, talk to God. Do business with God. Say, God, I know it's there. I don't want it there, but it is so hard because it is so good. Get on our knees and let's say, God, would you do whatever has to happen in my life that it gets removed, that distraction gets removed so that this week my percentage of life that is devoted to worshiping him moves closer and closer to being that 100 percenter. Amen? Amen. If the worship team wants to come, I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads with me and I want to pray for you. And as your heads are bowed, I really, I really mean it. Sometimes I say that and we just kind of move on, but I really want you to be undistracted in this moment. 60 seconds and we're done. Because I, what I want to pray with, for you about is next week. Next week we're going to be wrestling with the living God and what that fundamentally means to us in our life of worship and that question of are we trying to tame this living God and so I'm just preparing you ahead of time. I believe with all my heart, God has some serious business he wants to do with us, which is always for our good, certainly for his glory. But I, I love you enough, I wanted to give you a heads up. So this last week of our fast, you're praying about it, saying, God, prepare my heart, prepare us as a church for what you want to say to us next week. So let's pray. Lord, as we come to this time We have had a lot of truths and principles that have been put onto our spiritual plate this morning. But what they come down to in its fundamental point is that worship is all about you. And there's everything in our flesh, in our human nature that wants to put us at the center and make worship about us. And that's the battle we live with every single day. But God, we praise you that we have victory in that battle that our sin has been paid for, the power of sin has been conquered when we walk with you and place our faith in you. And so this week, help identify the ice cream in our life. I, help us identify the thing that keeps us from treasuring you and being satisfied in you and glorifying you and magnifying you and prizing you. And God, secondly, I ask that you would prepare us for what you want to say next week. As you help us wrestle with, are we worshiping truly you, the living God, or are we trying to tame you? So Lord, as, as we close this service, we're going to worship in the form of music. And, and this song is going to guide our hearts that through our lips, our heart of worship can draw near you. So receive this as, as our offering, our sacrifice of praise and worship together as a body. And these things we pray in your name. Amen. Why don't you stand together and let's sing this.